Cancer does not kill, and, and the, the, the goal of my, my talk today and, and these 15 minutes is to share with you how we much, must change our ideas and views and approach to this big problem that is cancer that's probably going to affect any of us in this room at some point, someday, to be able to find a solution um, that will allow us to cure and, and you know, beat this disease among others. So the first thing I want to show you is still the numbers and the positive fact that you know, the, the number of cancers is still very steady, it doesn't really change so much as you can see here on the slide. And most interestingly, uh, if you look at overall mortality of all cancers since 75, so a year after I was born, to 2007, it has not drastically decreased. We have discovered so many things. We've been able to do uh, so many great stuff, like you know, sending Twitter to your friend, a picture of me right now in Australia, but still we cannot beat cancer so much. So in order to show you what the real issue, I said, you know, I show them a real tumor because then they can understand what I feel every day on my routine work. So that's an ovarian cancer which affects women. I'm a gynecologist, so I'm more concerned about women, you know. Uh, still medicine has this gender consideration contrary to uh, social media. So here you can see a big ovarian tumor, which is these too much cells. You, we can resume it somehow, there's too many cells in there. And that's the only disease that will kill you by too much instead of not enough, like other disease. And if you go further and look at the abdomen of the patient, here are the metastatic lesion, you know, so the small nodules that can be anywhere and that we don't know how to get rid of. So when the tumor is located at its primary site, we still know somehow to, how to manage it. When the tumor goes beyond the primary site, then we lost. Medicine is today lost and we cannot cure this patient. And this is going even deeper to the liver. So how do we treat cancer now? It has not changed drastically since the last few years. So that's a, um, that was a picture of a surgery. As you can see, surgery is still based on the same two very medieval concepts. I cut, then I burn what I cut so it doesn't bleed. So you know we're still in the same range with better technology. The second aspect is medicine. And we have designed tons and thousands of medicines. Some of them drive by, uh, by uh, you know, research in plant biology or uh, chemical uh, research. And, and the goal is to prevent these cells from dividing. And you know, they work good and they have side effects. And then the last thing created by a French doctor, uh, Marie Curie, and who died of the side effects of her invention, is radiation therapy, and that was one of the first prototypes of radiation therapy machine. And often we have to kind of give all this treatment at the same time to a patient to get them, you know, to, to, to get the disease to be controlled. So that was before. And then I think there's two disruptive events in biology, in science, in medicine recently. The first one here is the discovery of the DNA as being the molecule that bears the source. So each of us, we have chromosomes, a certain number of chromosomes, and with different bases, A, T, C, G, and A, that defines me that I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I have these beautiful hairs, beautiful eyebrows, and all these things, and I'm different from you. So each of us have a different code. The second breakthrough, I think, is really, and that's a picture of a robotic surgery being done in, in Montreal uh, with some colleagues. And that kind of puts together everything that science and technology has achieved these uh, this last years, which is IT, communication, engineering, design, and all of this can be resolved in that. The surgeon can be here, and I could perform a surgery in, in the other side of the ocean right now. So let's look now how this major breakthrough have impacted uh, cancer survival lately. So that's statistic from 2012. And as you can see, uh, and it's very interesting because if you look at it, and I'm not a sociologist, but it gives you a lot of information. Uh, lung and bronchus going high because, you know, everybody, that's because of James Dean smoking a cigarette uh, uh, in the movie, so everybody starts smoking and lung and bronchus goes high. And that's because when we start uh, advocating for more health care and, you know, everybody stops smoking and it goes down. And you can see the women free themselves a little bit later. You know, it takes more time for women to get to the smoking stage. Anyway. So you can see, you know, the whole freedom of women here. The other aspect that is very interesting is that the, the, the two cancers that are going down in men are prostate and colon cancer. In women, it's breast and uh, colon cancer. All these cancers are screenable. So we screen women for breast cancer, we screen men for prostate cancer. 
So they didn't go down, the mortality, because we do better job at treating them, and we do to some extent. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but anyway. But they really go down, the mortality went down because we can screen them and detect them sooner. So that's not really having better therapy. For all of the other cancers that we're not able to detect soon, the mortality rate stays steady, and this is 1930. So your chances of dying of a pancreatic cancer is even a little bit higher now than in the 30s because probably of the side effects of the treatment. So the question is now, what did we miss to be able to be there? So at this point, you know, just to kind of show you, I'm going to ask for nine volunteers to come on stage. Come on, guys. Some nine people have to come here to, to, to take patients. And I show you how we think in cancer and how we have to change our view of it. And I'd be one of the volunteers, obviously. So go, go over there, and they're going to give you like a one package. So I'm not a master of design, as you can see. You guys are on TED. That's great. That's very exciting. OK, so here we are. OK, so today, if I have a cancer, and we all have this tumor that you know is it, it, hypothetical, uh, we have this tumor. You know, we all look the same to the doctor. We have a tumor. We look the same. So the next step is the surgeon removes the tumor. Can you guys remove the first page? And then we look a little bit different when we send the tumor to the pathologist. And they're going to be able to analyze it and say, oh, you know, these tumors like this look like this. These other tumors look like others. So let's find your mate. So you guys are good together. And I have to go with these guys here. So you see, can the green guys go over there? Go, 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 move. OK, great. So that was in the 80s. That's how we treat people. You know, We use some medication for them, somehow different medication for us, but still very rough. And then the whole era of genetic has allowed us, and I'm moving forward on the next slide. Uh, here, can, can we show the slide to the public? Uh, we, we, we're able to read the, the biology of the tumor now. So you see, this tumor has a lot of chromosome accumulated. And then we can go even further and look at, you know, segments of uh, the, the chromosome. So that's a whole chromosome. And you see this blue line show that some segments have been deleted. So you're missing the genetic information. The red line shows you that, you, you, you know, your, your, your chromosome has been amplified. So you have too much of this information. And then now the technology allows us to really read the code. So we can read the code. And to do a genome, the whole genome for me or my tumor, it would take around one or two days uh, to be able to read that. And we can pinpoint a single difference, a single mutation that might explain my disease. So all of this has allowed us as doctors and biologists to design an ID card uh, for the uh, tumor. And that had led to this major and tremendous impact on cancer, which is called targeted therapies. So let's play the game of targeted therapies and shift one more page. Uh, Freddy is too dynamic for me. I'm too old school. OK, anyway, so you see, that's a new layer of complexity coming in. So some of the blue become red. So you guys, you're with us. Come with me. You're with him. And then you guys are also to separate. Please separate together. No, you're with them. So you see, we can define now subgroups. So my subgroup might benefit from one medication that would not fit them or that would be useless for them. But still, you know, we can't cure cancer. You know, we still, we're going so deep inside, and we're able to, all of us, you know, characterize precisely our tumor and the genes coding our tumor, but still we cannot target perfectly the tumor. Because probably there's one element missing. Is if you look at both of us, uh, you're not really a good example. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, we look very different. I wish you were blonde, actually. <laughs> it's OK. So picture me as I'm blonde with long hair. So we look very different, you know. So that means that my gene codes are telling you information that my hair are different from his hair, my hands are different. But at the same time, they're telling us that each of, each of our body will react differently. And that's why, you know, some people get sick when they go to 
uh, have a drink at the tea stall next to their house, I didn't get sick in Nepal. So our body reacts differently to the environment. And for tumor, it's gonna be the same thing. So we go to the last layer, which kind of takes into consideration my own body and my reaction to cancer. And I'm not, I, I, I really wanna put a big warning, I'm not defensive of letting your body cure yourself. I'm saying that you have to really consider what your body is gonna, and how your body is gonna react to the disease to tailor your treatment. And then, then the picture changes. You know, the plus gets together, so you're a question mark, you stay here, I'm going with her, you guys go there, the minus go there, and then new groups are defined, you know? So we might have the tumor is very different, but the way our body, thank you very much, the way our body reacts to the disease might then be this way. You know, we need a certain treatment, they need a certain treatment, and for a group, we will never know. We will not know by this information, and we will need to find another layer of information. So you guys can go, thank you very much. So, thank you. So, do we have example, am I just inventing, making this up because that's cool? No, so that is an ovarian tumor, and that's very interesting. When, when I saw when I was a young student, we had this aggregate, these are tumor from the body of the patient, and the first thing you can see is half of the tumor are tumor cells, the other half of the cells are cells from the body of the patient. So here you can see normal cells. And these two cells interact, that's a normal cell, that's a cancer cell, to the philosophical point that at some point you don't see the barrier with the cells. So what is normal, what is sick is impossible to tell. And these cells are gonna exchange information. And here just, and I'm gonna go very briefly, here are two a cancer cell line, which would represent one subset, you know, the blue one, and here is another cancer cell line, which will represent the green one. And what happens when they meet normal cells of your body, they hold gene expression. The gene they express and the way they behave changes drastically. Not only it changes, but it doesn't change in the same direction. So if you have this background, you're gonna be very different after uh, meaning a normal cell, that's the other one. And there's thousands of genes, we can build networks that kind of picture this up. On the same way, that's the same thing in addition vitro. So you see the cells communicate together. The big ones are the normal cells, the small ones are the nasty cancer cells, and they interact together, they talk together all the time, up to, you know, the next level of complexity, which is here demonstrated by one of my great, great students, Jennifer, uh, who shows that an, a cancer cell can capture a piece of information or molecule from a normal cell, and then use it to resist to treatment, use it to metastasize, use it to migrate and go somewhere else. And the last very important piece of data that I wanna show you to illustrate my point is, uh, so don't, don't, don't try to find who's this guy, it's my father. Uh, so he's not a great doctor, you know. <laughs> So my father had smoked for many years in his life. He stopped recently, which is great for him. But he's 72, he's perfectly fine, visiting me in a few weeks here, and he doesn't have a lung cancer. And each time you buy a pack of cigarettes, it's written, you know, that's in French, because I'm French. Uh, uh, you know, smoking kills you. Smoking will develop a, a, a lung cancer in you. And it didn't happen to him. So even if he had the aggression that would be necessary to develop a cancer of the lungs, he didn't develop the cancer of the lungs. That means that his genetic background is somehow immune to this particular disease. He might be at risk for other disease. So all of this combined together, we're at this stage now. We're at the stage when we found we can characterize the tumor, we also can characterize what my genome is and what am I risk for. And all of these things are gonna be mingled together. But if you look at the picture, it's gonna be way more complex. So we need really to change our approach to the disease, to, to the biology of cancer, and really consider our own individuality in, in, in order to enter the next era, which is what we call the personalized medicine. It's not only what tumor I have, but who I am and what kind of tumor I bear, and then move it forward to the treatment stage. Thank you very much for your time.